Hello, my name is Gosh Ram. I am an environmental sustainability intern for Central Community College. Welcome and thank you all for attending today's building series. As always, the information provided is for anyone who is interested in sustainable practices. The building series is originally designed as specialized workshops for educators within the building, design, and construction industries. Throughout the presentation, if you have any questions, please submit them in the chat box located in the upper right hand corner titled chat. If you are in the Hastings campus live viewing room, you have the choice of using the microphone or the chat box. Also, as a reminder, CCC faculty and staff should register for the EAPD sessions for this event during, the, during or after the presentation. If you have any questions, please contact Corey Chedock. Today, we have the opportunity to hear from Ms. Stephanie Egger. Stephanie is a building scientist and engineer. She completed her Master of Building Science at the University of Southern California. Prior to USC, she completed her bachelor's degree in civil engineering from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute focusing in structures. While at RPI, she also received her LEED Green Associate Certification in Engineering and Training Accreditation. Her research interests include natural, nat natural ventilation, computational fluid dynamics, and occupant comfort. Stephanie is passionate about reducing building energy used through education. Stephanie works on the Autodesk Building Performance Analysis Team, where she exposes customers to the latest high-performance building design tools and provides training on how to best use them. Previously, she co-authored and launched a series of online courses that educate the next generation of designers. These courses and related certificate programs, Autodesk Building Performance Analysis Credit or Certificate, teach architects and engineers the basics of sustainable design and building performance through simulation and analysis tools. Stephanie pairs the creation of these educational offerings with the commitment of continuous improvement of building design technology to enable designers to create sustainable and meaningful designs. With that being said, please welcome Ms. Stephanie Egger. So as Gott mentioned, I'm Stephanie Egger. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about um, sustainable building design, specifically surrounded around building performance analysis. Um, and I'm coming to you today from San Francisco. And unfortunately, you don't get to see the lovely backdrop, but um, we can imagine. So as Scott said, I'm a technical evangelist for the building performance analysis team at Autodesk. Autodesk is a software company. Um, if you've ever um, seen kind of those 3D drafting drawings um, for building construction, AutoCAD, um, that's essentially what Autodesk is working on. Um, Autodesk has been around for a while in terms of developing architectural, engineering, construction, documentation tools. Um, and it's also changed a lot throughout the years. So we also are doing a lot of simulation analysis, helping designers um, and engineers create better buildings and products also. I have a background in building science and engineering as well. And at Autodesk, I focus on sustainable design. And what a technical evangelist is, is I work really closely with our customers to help enable them to design more sustainable buildings through analysis and simulation. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is several things. I've divided it into four parts. and. I'll be taking questions at each part, so feel free to chime in with any questions you have on the line. Um, first, the problem. You know, why are we focusing on buildings? Um, why out of, you know, all the aspects are we looking at buildings um, to improve their energy efficiency and sustainable design? Um, then I'll talk a little bit about building performance analysis, what it is, how it works, um, and how it can lead to better design decisions. Um, and then we'll kind of go through a little bit, a little design exercise um, that'll help introduce some of the fundamentals of building performance analysis. And finally, um, I'd love to leave you with some resources for learning more about building performance analysis. You know, unfortunately, I can't cover everything in these two hours, um, but I think it's a really great field and it's really interesting. And I'd love to provide you with the tools to be able to learn more and dive deeper. And again, I'll be stopping for questions um, during each of these sections. So let's dive right in um, with the problem. 
So these are some quick stats. Um, some of these might not be news. Uh, so according to the scientific community, climate change is happening, um, and its effects are having severe consequences for our society and environment. And because um, buildings account for 40% of energy use worldwide, um, focusing on buildings is a really important way to reduce humans' overall environmental impact. So building operations consume, and another kind of metric for that is they consume more than two-thirds of all the electricity. And in residential and commercial buildings consume 40% of the primary energy in the U.S., and in addition to 71% of the total electricity in the U.S. So in the many arenas of implementing sustainable design, there's a really great opportunity to focus on buildings and to reduce their impact and their resource use. Um, that's why working, I work mostly with architects, engineers, construction managers, really anyone, building owners, anyone kind of being able to, having a touch on the building to, because it's, it's not just one person's responsibility to have everyone really be committed to reducing energy use for buildings. So let's kind of harp a little bit more on the project. So I mentioned essentially building for energy hogs. Um, worldwide, they're using 40% of energy. In the U.S. specifically, they're using 47.6%. That's more than transportation, and it's more than industry. Um, so these visuals, this visual itself is coming from Architecture 2030, which if you haven't checked it out, I really recommend you do. It's an organization that's been established as a response to the climate change crisis. And essentially, Architecture 2030's mission is to rapidly transform the built environment from the major as the major contrib contributor of greenhouse gas emissions. So, and to change it to have buildings be part of the solution instead. And one of the um, challenges that Architecture 2030 has put in place essentially is the 2030 Challenge, um, which is an ask to the global architecture and building community to adopt um, these targets. So. Today, if you know, for new buildings today, what the target would be would be a 70% reduction of the average fuel use, fuel greenhouse gas, fossil fuel use, greenhouse gas emitting, and energy consumption of a building type for the average median. So for example, 70% um, reduction for whatever that average is in that region. So if we're looking at region, we're also looking at building type. And we're going to be reducing this target throughout the year. So in 2020, we want an 80% reduction from the average. In 2025, 90. And leading up to 2030, the name of the challenge, um, we're reaching carbon neutral, um, which is using no fossil fuels or greenhouse gas emitting energy to operate our buildings. So a lot of people, organizations, governments, have adopted this challenge, which is really exciting. Um, and essentially what that means, you know, individuals, architects, building designers, construction managers who believe this is important and feel they want to reach this goal, um, a lot of firms and companies really um, internationally and also locally have been adopting this challenge. And this is how they're, you know, in the building community, this is what they're designing to now. They're designing to this 2030 challenge. A building they're designing today is 70% is is below the average for their location. Um, local governments have adopted this, state government, and in addition to the federal government. And what that means is all new federal buildings are adopting these standards. So this is really exciting. You know, and also, in addition, um, I know especially out here in California, we have a lot of new energy codes coming into play. We have a lot of new regulations coming in, which essentially means we're having to design to the 2030 challenge in addition to other state regulations. So how do we meet this? Um, it's not, you know, there's not a manual. There's not oh, an easy one, two, three process um, that straight away tells you kind of how to design a sustainable building that has reduced energy use. And so Architecture 2030 has identified three main areas. The first one being design strategies, um, allowing you to ways that you can reduce your building's energy use and by improving its performance. The other two are renewables. Um, whether it's on-site or off-site. But it's important to stress that really these design strategies are really key. Um, it does no service to design an inefficient building 
and then just put a lot of P, um, solar panels on the roof to make up for our poor energy performance. We really want to reduce the use of that one building first um, and then look to renewables to compensate um, what we're unable to achieve through passive design. And these design strategies is where I'm going to be focusing the talk today, um, and that's what we're going to dive into. Um, again, you know, renewables, I think, are a great asset, but we don't want renewables to drive our design. Another reason, you know, we're being asked, you know, the industry has this need now to design more energy efficient and more sustainable buildings. Um, and it's a core competency now in terms of hiring. Um, and I bring this up to this group because I know, you know, academia is a really great place um, to start thinking about, you know, what, what you want to do afterwards. And so it's really important um, as we're moving, for those who want to move into the building industry, to really start to understand this problem and understand the need. And it's also that we have this great need and we don't have enough people to fill this need. So in 2012, the American Institute of Architects, the AIA, conducted a survey and found that 56% of architecture firms are having difficulty finding the staff and employees they need that have the adequate green skills, the green skills, the green skills needed to design sustainable buildings and help to meet this 2030 challenge, um, in addition to a lot of other state um, regulations in terms of energy code. And so there's this need, and then there's a gap. Um, the 56%, that's even higher for small firms. Um, for small firms, it's closer to 70% of the firms can't find employees they need to help design this new building stock that's more energy efficient. So net-net, we need to design more energy efficient buildings, and we need to know how. Um, there's this great need in the industry, as I mentioned, but also there's, you know, kind of a missing supply. So I'll pause now um, with just kind of that quick introduction, if there's any questions on the line. Um, and then if not, I'll just dive into the next section. If anybody has questions, they simply need to put it in the chat box. If you're in the Hastings uh, Cedar Room, you do have a microphone that you can directly ask Stephanie your questions. And Stephanie, just give it, um, let's just give it 30 seconds. That usually takes a few minutes for the chat to come in. Okay, we have one that's come in. It's asking, uh, they're asking um, what uh, government or businesses that you know off of the top of your head that have adapted the 2030 challenge. Right. So um, a lot of architecture firms, um, inter some international firms, um, I think HOK, SOM, um, we kind of call these the alphabet soup of architecture firms. You know, there's a lot of three-letter firms out there. Um, a lot of local governments, um, I know the city of San Francisco, um, if you go to Architecture 2030's website, um, they have an adopters tab, and I can kind of bring that up at the end if we have time and share that with you. And you can search um, by state, you can search by city, and look through the adopters. Um, when I looked, I think in Nebraska, I don't, I think there were some, several individual adopters, um, but there were no um, cities who had adopted it yet. So there's a challenge for um, you all out there today um, to try and get some local cities to adopt this challenge. Okay, we don't have any other questions in the chat box, so why don't you go ahead and uh, move forward, Stephanie. Thank you. So now the second part of building performance analysis, what it is and, and how it leads to better design decisions. Um, so we know we need to, you know, design more sustainable buildings and increase energy efficiency. So, you know, this is a quick search when you kind of Google sustainable building design. Um, these are some of the visuals you get. You get these beautiful visual renderings. Um, you know, a lot of these are generated for competitions or a lot of these are um, ideas that people have. And no doubt, these buildings are, you know, really connecting the building occupants with the environment. We see a lot of green. We see a lot of plants. We see connection to the environment. But, um, you know, I'm coming from an engineering background. I, I am skeptical. How do I know that these buildings are reaching that 70% reduction target? 
How do I know they're providing adequate daylighting? Um, I, I want proof. I, I want to know how these buildings are working, and I want to know that they are reaching these energy efficiency goals. So how do we know? How do we know these buildings really are sustainable? And oftentimes what we see um, from architects, engineers, people involved in the building design process are these types of schematics. Um, and it's okay if you can't read um, each of the details of this. I'll just give you a high-level overview. So, for example, um, this might be created in response, you know, this is the building design. And this is a, a drawing that starts to describe how the building is working. Um, so, for example, here is a little schematic drawing of how um, rainwater is being collected and then piped down to um, an underground storage tank. Stephanie, I'm going to have to interrupt you. We are still viewing the how do we know slide. Okay. So now we see a schematic. So can you just repeat uh, that section um, for the viewers? Sure. Thank you. So um, this schematic is something that you'll typically see um, with architecture or engineers are producing to help communicate how their building is actually working. Um, so in terms of sustainable design strategies. And so again, I'll just I'll give you a high level overview of um, what's going on. So don't worry about reading each of these little sections. Um, this is an actual an example from an actual building. So for example here we have, this is describing how rainwater is coming down and being piped down to this um, underground storage tank here. Um, there's also some kind of arrows indicating where potential airflow will be so they can capitalize on natural ventilation and rely less on their heating and cooling system. Um, there's also a schematic over here that details how wastewater is being reused for gardening. So again, these are just some um, strategies and this is how they're being mapped to the actual building design. So here's another schematic um, for another example. And again, you know, it's okay if you can't connect one, two, and three right now. I'll just give it over at a high level. So one of the main things we see is airflow through the building, these arrows indicating natural ventilation through the building and also up through this top part. Um, we also see the sun, um, how it's an angle in the summertime versus the angle in the wintertime. Um, we also have some shading devices called out here and some light shelves called out here. So this is a tool that um, a lot of designers and people working on buildings will use to help describe the sustainable design strategies. But I'll bring it up again, how do we know? Um, so to go back to the image, how do we know that the air is actually moving in this left to right direction, have you on this image, versus from right to left? You know, if it moves from one direct, through the building in one direction, um, that's great, but if it's not moving in through that direction, that could pose a problem. And it could pose a problem like this, and I bring up this example um, because I think it's, First of all, it's really familiar. Um, you have people in an office building. Some are comfortable, some are not comfortable. I know I am certainly this person on the end here who is always freezing cold. Um, and I'm stressing this proof point because if we can't verify the behavior and how our building is interacting with the environment, it's very likely that once the building is built, something will go wrong and our occupants won't be comfortable and they won't want to spend time in the building. So in this example, there's a disconnect between how much heat is entering the building um, and the heating and cooling system, the HVAC system. So what we could have done to prevent this is had we studied the sun path and had we understood um, where the sun will be at specific times of year and specific times of day, we might have learned that we might have needed some shade um, for this window. Because if we did have, without the shades, the sun's coming in, it's heating up the space too much, um, which is kicking on the heating system, the heating and cooling system. Um, and these people over here, towards the core of the building, they're not receiving that heat. So if more people are comfortable, they're more happy, they're healthier, they have a better experience in the building, um, this is not a great building experience. So that's why we need to make sure we really understand how the environment is impacting our building and our occupants. Otherwise, we can end up with an uncomfortable scenario. So let's revisit this. So if we, for this image, we would need to understand several different things to make sure it's actually functioning this way. For example, this shading design. We'll need to be able to predict the position of the sun throughout the year and at different times of day 
to understand that the shade is actually functioning so that we're actually blocking the sun during the hot winter months. But then also we want to make sure that we're letting the sun in and letting light in during the cooler winter months so we can capitalize on some of that heat gain. For this cooling tower that was called out, we'll also want to make sure that stack effect. So this cooling tower works by stack effect, which is pulling um, moist, warm air out of the, out of the building. And we're going to need to make sure that the dimensions of this tower are accurate and that the environmental conditions actually enable stack effects so this cooling tower works as expected. This light shelf in here, the way light shelves work is they um, reflect light and they bring it deeper into your building versus just having a regular window um, that will just have kind of light right where the window is. Light shelves bring light further and deeper into the building. So again, we're going to need to understand where the sun is um, during the different times of day. And we're also going to want to understand the material properties of that light shelf. So it really can bring light far into the building versus stopping short maybe three feet of the window. For natural ventilation, these beautiful arrows, we're going to want to make sure that the wind actually is coming from that direction. So we're going to want to study the wind rows. Um, we're also going to want to make sure that our window size is appropriate to facilitate natural ventilation. If we have these teeny tiny windows, um, chances of getting some good airflow are going to be pretty slim. And finally, for daylighting design, um, as we're bringing daylighting into the building and we want to use less electric lighting, we also want to make sure we don't bring too much light in because that can lead to glare. Um, that can lead to, you know, people having difficulty, people squinting, wanting to pull down the shades all the time. Um, and we also want to make sure it's an even distribution so we don't have some areas that are very brightly lit contrasted with some areas that are very dark. So these are just a few of the things. So next time you see one of these schematics, hopefully you can start to kind of pull out, piece together, always ask questions. Ask how do we know, how do we know this is working the way it's proposed? And the way we can start to answer these how do we know questions is first through experience. Um, you know, with a lot of things, experience is really one of the best indicators and, and ways to help solve problems. Um, for example, I know in my office, um, around 3 p.m. every day, the sun starts to come in and bounce, it hits my computer screen and there's a really bright glare and I can't really see what I'm doing. That's experience. However, if we're building in a new environment, if we're working on a building that might not be somewhere where we don't have much experience, um, we really want to start looking at analysis. Um, this can help us answer questions. This can let us explore. Um, for example, if I was designing a building in Grand Island, I've never been there. I'm going to have to, I don't really can't use too much of my experience, but I can use analysis to help answer my questions by um, proposing certain scenarios um, and, guess, and using that information to inform my design decisions. So at its core, building performance analysis is using analysis data to support design decisions. So I mentioned the wind rows um, and how it's important for natural ventilation. So we'll really want to make sure when we're trying to use natural ventilation in our building that we know where the wind is coming from, what direction, during what time of year, so we can make sure we orient and position our building so it can get most of that airflow. We'll also want to make sure that we understand the wind speeds. For example, we don't want to want to let hurricane speed wind into our building um, and have people have papers flying everywhere off their desk. We want to make sure that that wind speed we're bringing into the building is appropriate and low enough that people feel comfortable but aren't having a kind of mini tornado inside of their building. Also, when we talk about energy use, we're going to want to study heating and cooling loads these are just some examples, um, these graphs, of information that you can gather through energy analysis. Um, this is an analysis you can use to predict your building's energy use. And it can also help assign. So for example, I can see if my light, my lighting system is using most of the energy, if my um, plug loads are using a lot of the energy, or maybe it can also tell me that my building is using a lot of heat energy because I have inefficient windows. 
So this information is also really valuable to help inform our design decisions. And this last example I'll give is around daylighting. Um, so this scenario is, is a classroom. And what I'm trying to figure out is, can I bring in enough daylight so that I don't have to use my electric lights, I don't have to turn them on, but I also need to make sure that my students have enough light to be able to read at their desk. So I might try um, different design scenarios. In this first example, I don't have any shades. I just kind of have a big glass wall, and I'm, I'm trying to see how much light is coming in. I can kind of see there's a lot of light here, but these students who are sitting over on the left side of the classroom aren't getting enough light. Um, so then I built a light shelf. This light shelf, it brings in a little bit more. I can kind of see on the ceiling there's more reflected light, um, but it's still kind of dark over here, and these students still might have a hard time reading depending on the time of day. This last scenario is I just put in a skylight. Um, a skylight kind of brings it down, brings the light into the space, much more even. Um, but now I need to make sure that I don't have too much light, that it's not too bright, and I don't. My students aren't going to be sitting there with sunglasses on. So this is these are just a few ways that analysis can be used to help inform your design decisions, and it's this really powerful tool um, because if we aren't using analysis and analysis tools. We're just kind of guessing. If I had built this first option without checking or verifying anything, my students might be sitting in the dark, and I might have to have my electric lights on all the time, which is using more energy. Um, if I decided just to build this second option without testing it, I might find that my students are just getting way too much light, and then you know, shortly after construction of the building, we're going to have to do something about that skylight, because it is just making that space unusable. So by being able to use analysis and simulation to iterate different design scenarios, we can get better information and lead to better design decisions and lead to more comfortable occupants at the end of the day, which really what is what it's all about. So at the end of the day, building performance analysis really leads to informed design decisions. Um, and this is where the two are coming together and really bringing and informing any kind of questions we have around our building's performance. So I'll pause again for any questions, if anyone has any. OK, so folks, as a reminder, you can put questions in the chat box. If you are on the Hastings campus um, in the Cedar Room, you can unmute your mic and ask the questions directly to Stephanie. I'll ask her to pause again for 30 seconds, and then if we don't receive anything, we'll move forward. Okay, so one question we've received is, can two-year institutions focus on teaching students these skills? So uh, the students that we're talking about at Central are not um, pursuing four-year degrees with us. So out of what you've highlighted, I guess they're asking what can be focused on in two years. Absolutely. So I think anyone, even if you're not in school, even if you want to do this in your free time, can start to learn about this stuff. Um, there's a resource at the end, um, which I'll share with you all. Um, but the short of it is, is yes, I believe, you know, whether, and what we're about to dive into is different sections of building performance analysis um, that you can dive into. And I'll kind of make this caveat, you know, building performance analysis goes beyond sustainability. It includes kind of structural analysis, seismic and geotechnical. For the purpose of this presentation, I'm focusing on the sustainable side of things. Um, and I'm going to dive into a few topics. So um, something around daylighting, for example, is kind of a really great something you can kind of kind of put in a module um, and focus on. Um, and a lot of people in the industry um, tend to have specialties, right? So we have some people who are really great lighting analysts, or we have some people who are really great um, natural ventilation specialists. So um, you can definitely, I believe, you know, um, one of the, the resources I'm going to uh, share later is essentially kind of it's tied to a semester. Um, it can be tied to a college semester. 
Um, and it's the course that can kind of get everything at a high level and give you that high level overview. Um, but also, you know, I would recommend that just maybe diving into kind of one focus area is also appropriate for a two-year program. You received one more question. I think it's uh, similar to what you've responded to, but I'll just uh, let you respond um, again. Are there any free software available online that can do simu simulations that you've just showed? Absolutely. So everything I'm going to show you today, all the software tools are freely available for students and educators. And I will give you that resource at the end. Um, I'm also happy to follow up um, if there's any questions around how to access that software, how to download it, where you can get it from. I have all those resources available, um, and I'll post them here. And I can also follow up to um, those on the line who are interested in accessing it. So essentially, everything I'm showing today, you can do. OK, thanks, Stephanie. With that, there hasn't been any others uh, typed in, so uh, please uh, proceed. Great. So next section is getting started with BPA. This is really the meat. This is the exciting part. Um, this is where we're diving into the tools. And like I just mentioned, all the stuff I'm showing you, all the tools I'm showing you, um, are things that are free for students and educators. Um, we, this is all accessible for you. So if you have any questions about how to do it, um, some of the resources I'm going to provide with you really let, are going to let you dive deep with these tools that I'm talking about. So before we dive in, um, I want to just quickly address BIM and what BIM is because it's really kind of the core of building performance analysis and it's also a really big um, access point in the industry right now. So BIM stands for Building Information Modeling. And what it is is an approach to design that uses intelligent 3D computer models to create, modify, share, and coordinate information throughout the design process. So a traditional process might look like, you know, the architect is responsible for these set of drawings, the engineer is responsible for this set, there's a drafter responsible kind of for coordinating everyone, there's a construction manager who really wants to look at um, how are they going to actually make this building come alive. Um, and BIM brings all of those stakeholders into one central model, um, which is really exciting. So a lot of architecture and engineering firms are using BIM to drive more efficient design processes. So instead of having you know, 18 different sets of drawings, um, BIM is really kind of letting everyone look at this one model and really understand the building in 3D, letting them visualize it however it wants. And it's also a kickoff point for analysis. So a lot of the stuff we're talking, I'm talking about today, it isn't removed from the building design process. It's embedded. It's part of it. So in, addition, in addition to, kind of, to driving more efficient design practices within firms, BIM is also a really powerful tool for sustainable design because it can help you test, analyze, and improve your design. Um, so this image I have right here, this is a, a visual rendering from um, BIM. And so this is a model, but this is a model used to represent visually what the building will look like and feel like. Um, but you can also use this model for analysis, like I'm about to talk about, or you can also use it for documentation. Um, you can use these models in a variety of ways. And this graphic you know, just starts to cover the tip of the iceberg of really how you can use them. You know, you're using it in design. You're using it to visualize your model and communicate to your stakeholders. Building owners really like them because it allows them to see and experience their building before it's built. Um, it allows you to analyze and check in on your building's performance, again, with structural, sustainable design, um, any kind of thing you can think about simulating with your, for your building before you build it. It lets you document. It lets you create those construction documents. Um, and it's also really important for building. You can actually simulate what the building process will be like using them. So for today, I'm going to focus on the design and analyze piece. That's really where building performance analysis sits. Um, this design, analyze, change your design, check it again, this really iterative process of using information to improve your design. So, and before, you know, we kind of dive in, this is one of my favorite quotes um, by statistician George E.T. Box. All models are wrong, but some are useful. Um, and this is definitely very true for them. The key is to make your models useful as, and make them as useful as possible. 
So, for example, a model is useful if it's able to predict future observations and help control future events and explain past observations. Um, so, for example, if I could use them to simulate my daylight and understand if I have enough light in my space to avoid um, a situation like I, re I re mentioned in those classrooms, that's going to be uncomfortable. So that modeling is useful, um, you know, but take it with a grain of, grain of salt. Remember your experience also. The two work together very well. So to kick things off, I'm going to share a video. Um, and this video has audio. Um, I know you can um, kick it off on your own, and we'll we'll watch the whole video, um, and then afterwards I'll close it out and kind of give you a little high level. But I think this video is really great at kind of setting the scene for building performance analysis and all of the things that we're going to start looking at. All right, so hopefully you found that video useful. It's essentially setting the stage. Um, we mentioned a lot of passive strategies. All right, it mentioned a lot of passive strategies. And passive strategies are really at the core of building performance analysis. We're, we're going to want to test these strategies. So now I'm going to go through and explain how we can start to simulate and verify that the types of strategies that were mentioned in that video are actually working. So I made up a little design scenario. Um, I am going to be designing a sustainable building, high performing, really great, possibly even net zero in Grand Island. Um, I've never been to Grand Island, um, so I can't rely on too much experience, so I'm going to need to use analysis to help inform my design decisions. Um, and along the way, again, I'll, I'll pause for questions at the end of this, but um, as you all are probably much more familiar with Grand Island than I am, um, if you can confirm or deny any of the design strategies I'm kind of picking out, um, that would be great and then be something we could start to have a discussion around. So the first thing that was mentioned in the video that I'm going to really want to understand is my weather data. Um, there are a lot of passive strategies that rely on the external environment. So understanding if my location is hot and humid, uh, dry and arid, cold, hot, any of those things is really going to help me in terms of in detecting um, sustainable design practices. For example, um, if I want to rely on natural ventilation, but my location is just really cold all the time and has really high speed winds, that's probably not such a great idea. So here's some weather data for Grand Island. Um, and I'm just right now looking at temperature um, and that wind rose. And from the temperature, you know, this middle line is the average. The red is the max. The blue is the minimum. Um, you know what? I'm pretty much going to say that Grand Island has a, is a mixed climate. You know, it's hot and cold. Um, you have both extremes. So that's something I'm going to want to account for. When I look at this wind rose, I see that most of the time it looks like the winds are coming from the south, southeast direction. And this is annual. I'll also probably want to break it down and look seasonally for spring versus summer versus winter um, to understand that. So natural ventilation looks like it could be a good opportunity, but I will want to make sure I position my building appropriately, and I will want to vet these wind speeds um, and dive into them a little deeper to make sure I understand um, that I'm not letting wind that are too high um, for occupant comfort into the building. So the next thing I want to look at is my site. I want to understand what buildings are around it. You know, very rarely do we have the chance to design on a completely flat, untouched piece of land. Um, so what I'm looking at here is, you know, I just kind of pulled in a satellite image. I modeled some of the existing buildings around it surrounding it based on that satellite image. And I'm pretending this green spot here is my site. This is where I want to build my building. I think right now it's a parking lot. So let's make it, let's make it a new um, school or university campus or something. Let's look at that there. And so I want to understand my site for several reasons. I want to know if other buildings are shading or blocking my site's access to sunlight. 
I want to know how the site's also interacting with wind. I know I have a lot of, most of my winds are coming from the south and southeast direction, so I want to know um, at the pedestrian level what that looks like. So if I decide to build a courtyard, um, I know that my occupants are going to be comfortable in, in getting the access to air that they need. I also just want to understand if there's, you know, major roads nearby that can lead to noise and acoustic issues. Um, I want to understand maybe there's a park nearby, if there's a view um, where would I want it to be, you know, maybe there's a great view to the south um, of a park that I want, to, I want to have my occupants be able to connect to. So right now I'm going to jump into a web platform that I can use to start to understand. So this is that same site I just um, brought in an image into that PowerPoint. And so here's my site, um, and I can kind of explore around it. This is what I built. And one of the other things I can do is I can start to look at my sun and shadows. So I've enabled shadows. And what I can do is different times of year, I can play around and see the different shadows that are being cast. Um, this tool I'm using is called Formit. It's a web-based platform. Um, and so you just have to go to a website. You don't even have to download anything, and you can start to play around with this. Um, you can also access it on tablets. Um, so that's really fun because you can actually kind of do it in the field um, and understand. So conditions I would want to look at, for example, I would probably want to look at it um, near the winter solstice, near December 21st, um, when the shadows are the longest. So I can look at that and kind of see how the shadows are moving throughout the day on my site. And I'm paying most of my attention to this green spot right here um, because I want to know how that's going to be affected. Um, I'll also want to look at the summer solstice. The, sum, the solstices are good examples of extreme conditions. Um, and so now I can, again, starting in the morning, I can see my days a little bit longer. I have more sunlight hours and my shadows are shorter. And so that's then, and I, you know, my sun is setting actually much later, too. It's not dark until later. And then I can look at the equinoxes in March and September to understand what the average conditions are going to look like. So let's look at one in March. All right, and let's start in the morning. Let's look, okay. So, so far, it looks like my site has pretty good access to sun throughout the day. However, you know, this is important to study because, for example, if this building right here, if it was, if I had changed it, let's say it's wider and let's say it's taller. Now let's see how that changes things. Let's turn that sun back on. And now I see in the afternoon, for most of the times throughout the year, I'm getting shade. I'm getting shading. So I have to consider that now in my design if this building were much larger. So that's just one quick way to start to do site analysis and really to understand your solar access, um, which is really important as we're considering using the sun um, for heat gain, which I think we're definitely going to want to do given those low temperatures in the winter. We don't want to have to pump heating too much. We're going to want to have some of that solar gain in the winter time. Um, and we're also going to want to make sure in the summertime, since it's really, really warm, um, that we're blocking the sun as appropriate. So this is a good way to start to understand that. And so another way is this is the sun path. Um, and so what we saw was we were just visualizing shadows, but we can also for our site visualize the sun path um, and where it will be in the sky at different times of year. And that those second schematic I showed you where it had the sun angle in the summer versus the sun angle in the winter. Um, this is a diver, this is a, something I can use to start to understand that. So I can look at it at a specific point in time. Um, so for here, I'm looking September 23rd at 2.12 p.m. What are my shadows going to look like? Um, and where is the sun going to be? And what's the path for the rest of the day? Where will it be for each hour? And can also look on an annual scale. Um, and so with summer being up here at the top, winter being down at the bottom, understand the sun path throughout the whole year. Um, and again, I haven't even designed my building yet. I'm just exploring my site. I'm just exploring what it looks like. Um, you know, at the next stage, I might start to kind of bring in some massing ideas. You know, do I want a big box? Do I want to want a tall box? Do I want something low and flat or high? And also, a lot of this is based off of um, building codes given for specific districts. So another thing I can start to look at is solar radiation. How much 
of the sun peaking am I getting? So I have my site here and I have my surrounding buildings. And what I did was I started just making some shapes. You know, maybe this is a campus center and then there's some dormitories nearby and, you know, just some little shapes. And I'm trying to understand um, several different things. So, for example, one thing I might be looking at is the rooftops um, to understand if there's good potential to put solar panels. Um, looking at this real quick, this image on the left, I'm going to guess this narrow building here might not be the best for solar panels because it looks like it's getting a lot less light, um, a lot less sun solar radiation than the others, which are this brighter yellow. Um, I can also kind of look around and look at the spaces and just try to understand um, are there areas that are going to be, is the building shading itself essentially, is it a self-shading building, um, or is you know, everything just kind of fair game. So this is a you know, solar analysis, I can do it on my surrounding sites as well, but something I can do to just kind of get an early understanding of, of what some early ideas I have for my design are. I can also use this solar analysis when I'm, I'm ready to start looking at um, shading devices as to what those shading devices will look like. Um, this is a study to understand, okay, I have these regular plain shading devices that are just rectangles. Okay, well, what happens if I pull out um, one section of these and make them more triangular? And then what happens if I add this whole vertical shading element? And these are things that you're going to want to simulate throughout the year at different times of the day to understand, again, you know, are these shades allowing enough light um, to kind of capitalize enough solar heat gain for the winter time so we have to use less heating, mechanical heating. And we also want to make sure that they're blocking some of that um, solar radiation in the summertime um, to make sure that our building's not overheating and we don't have to compensate by pumping some AC. I can also start to do some wind analysis. So again, here's my site. Um, I brought it into this wind tunnel simulator. Um, you know, most of the winds are kind of coming from the south, southeast direction. So I want to make sure that, you know, I just kind of want to recognize some wind patterns. Um, there might be some kind of tunneling, canyoning effects where um, it looks right here through this building that wind speeds are a little bit faster. That's probably just kind of given the way the site is laid out. Um, so the air is going a little bit faster through here, so that's, I just want to be aware of that. Um, and just kind of understand at the pedestrian level, um, you want to make sure that, you know, if someone's carrying an umbrella, it's not turning inside out or their, their papers aren't flying everywhere. So this can be used kind of on the urban scale, looking at the whole site, and it can also be used on a smaller scale. So another thing we can start to do is early energy analysis. And we can do this really at any stage. We can do this before we have a building designed. We can do this later um, when we're really detailed design. And we can do it to start to really just understand how much building is our energy using and what decisions can we make to reduce that. All right, so I'm going to play another little video, but I'm going to launch it on my side so you all don't have to worry about anything. And I'm just going to kind of walk through this process. Um, and this is, again, something that you, you all can access, and I'll show you how to do that later. And what it's going to do is I'm going to walk through the process of maybe very early in my design process, um, start looking at what decisions I can start making around my building. So I'm starting with some, some graphs here, and I'll explain what those mean later. So one of the very first things to do, um, and very most important things to do, is to set my project location. So I'm typing in Grand Island, and that's important so that I'm pulling the right weather data, I'm understanding my site, and I'm getting the right information. So after I set that, I want to set my building type. Um, it's important to understand what I'm doing when I'm building an office. Am I building a hospital? Am I building a school? Um, what have you? Because building types use different types, use different amounts of energy, and they use energy differently. For example, an office is going to use energy very differently um, from a school or from your own home. Think of all in, in an office, you know, how you maybe you have 100 people, every person's running their personal computer, and they all have lights, versus in your home, um, you have a dishwasher, and you have a washer and dryer, so you have different ways of using energy. So I'm setting my, my building type 
to help hone in on what that energy performance will be. So for this example, I'm just selecting a school or university. And then I also am going to set my form. So if I'm early in the design stage, I might not know exactly what my building is going to look like, but I might have an idea. I might know that it's tall and skinny, or I might know that it's wide and flat and low to the ground. So these are just some preset building types that I can use, and I can go back and change them. And as I actually design my building, I can change that as well. Um, but just to give me a very early idea. Um, and it's important to get an idea early on, um, because as a building owner, you know, I might say, I want a net zero energy. And I'll say that to my architects and engineers. And then the architects and engineers have to go and say, OK, well, how are we going to do this? Um, and kind of maybe given cost constraints or budgetary concerns, um, I might or might not be able to achieve net zero um, as the owner. And this tool can help architects and engineers communicate that to the owner. So now I can start to look at these different parameter factors. For example, there's roof insulation, there's window glass, there's building orientation, all these different things I can play around with with my building design without actually having to model it yet to get information on how my building is, is performing. So I'm going to look at roof insulation first. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to look around at different. Each of these dots represents a different type of roof insulation. So I can look over here on this end, um, something that might not be performing as well. This is my energy cost mean, this dial right here that's red. This is energy cost per um, square unit area. So in this example, it's US dollars per square meter per year. So this is my energy cost for each square meter of my building. If I'm selecting um, this roof option, for example, or these, you know, if I don't know exactly which one, that's OK. But if something on the lower performing end, maybe this is part of an older building, my energy performance isn't, it's going to be kind of high. It's going to be hard to get that 70% um, below the mean. But if I choose something on the high performing end, it's going to be lower. So it's not green yet. It's not perfect, but I'm doing a better job. Also, if I select something in the middle, the middle is usually typical of code compliance, and so what a standard would be. So now I can go through and kind of play around with these different factors. Now I'm looking at window glass and all these different window glass types I can use and trying to understand what a good option will be to help me hit my energy target. So I'll just let this kind of play through. And I know it's moving quickly, but it's just kind of showing you how quickly you can start to get information. I'm looking at lighting efficiency now. If I'm choosing really efficient light bulbs or really inefficient light bulbs, how is that going to impact my energy use? Wall insulation, what's my wall construction looking like? Plug load efficiency, this is something that's really important and is often one of the main drivers for energy performance. So I've set a few of these. I haven't set all of them. But let's talk about these results that are coming out up here. So I have my dial. I'm at 14.7%. I'm getting a little better, but I'm not quite there yet. 14.7 um, you know, US dollars per meter squared per year is my energy cost mean. These are some project goals here. You know, This top line is where I'm at right now. This is my project goal that I've set. This is where I want to be. And actually down here is the architecture 2030 goal, that 70% below median. So I have a lot of work to do to get down to that goal. So I'm going to hop back over. And now I'm talk a little bit about daylighting analysis. Um, daylighting analysis can be really helpful in informing questions and answering questions like, do I have enough light? Is my light in the right places? Kind of with that classroom example, um, I wanted to make sure that I had enough light so I didn't have to use electric lights and use extra energy. But I also wanted to make sure I didn't have too much light. I wanted to make sure that it was there was a lot of visual comfort. Um, I can also use lighting analysis to help me meet um, standards and certifications. So for example, LEED. Um, there are certain LEED credits that um, require you meet a certain threshold of light, you know, between X and Y, you need to be between those values of light. And so there's plugins that you can use that can help you identify that and say, yes, you have enough light to meet lead criteria, or no, you don't. Um, this rendering here can also be used to understand the space inside. 
um, it can be used to understand how much light is hitting the floor, how much light is hitting the walls. When we talk about light hitting the walls, that's something really important, for example, for a museum. A lot of museums really want to utilize natural daylighting, but they don't want too much light on the artwork um, because that can lead to um, poor quality, you know, it can degrade faster. So daylighting can be really useful in answering, you know, do I have enough light? Can I offset my electric lighting? And it's really valuable. And I would say, you know, there's a lot of specialties um, and areas of focus um, out there in building performance analysis. And daylighting is one of the really popular ones right now, um, really understanding this and with the new efficiencies of um, light bulbs we're also seeing. And so also, you know, we're doing this throughout the design process. This isn't just, you know, check it once. Yep, we looked at lighting analysis. Now we're done. Um, we want to do this throughout the design process. And we want to check in, in our energy use. We want to check in our daylighting. And we want to check in on all of it throughout the process. And it all kind of culminates into this one thing, which, all, which is called whole building energy analysis. How is your building performing? And with BIM, what we can do is we can model our building to kind of full detail. We can put in the HVAC system. We can put in our thermal properties in our walls. And we can run an analysis that considers all these different building design parameters to get information around how our building is performing. So this is just a sample dashboard of some things I might look at if I run an energy analysis. I'll probably want to look at where my energy use in my building is going. So am I, are my windows losing a lot of energy? Or maybe I could choose a better wall construction to make my building more efficient. Um, and if we just zoom in, you know, monthly cooling and monthly heating loads are a really good indicator of what we can do to help inform those design decisions. Um, and what we can do is we can start to solidify and look at these and understand, OK, if my equipment is really high, what does that mean? If I choose more efficient equipment, will that help my building's performance? And so we can start to identify essentially what the biggest energy sucks in our building are going to be and remedy that and go back and check them again. And like I mentioned, you know, this isn't just, OK, yep, we looked at the sun path. Check. Let's move on to the next thing. You're going to want to, this is an iterative process. You want to do this throughout the design process at all different stages. You know, I just kind of gave one example of a pathway that I might take um, in designing a sustainable building in Grand Island. You know, I looked at the weather, and then I could do some early analysis. I want to look at the site. I want to move on and start to understand my solar implications. I want to, and maybe I'll check in and do another energy analysis. You know, okay, some of the decisions I've made, they've gotten me to this yellow um, interface, which means I'm getting closer. Um, and then, you know, as I detail my building, I can do some more detailed analysis as well. And I can kind of move towards a kind of a more closed in, more accurate number. So I can start to look at shading device design. That's something that's a little bit more detailed. I might, at this stage over here, when I'm looking at my site, I probably don't really know what my shading devices are going to look like. I don't have enough information. But later in the design process, when I'm designing them, I can go back and check. I can look at the wind. I can look at the wind also early on when it's just the site. But I can look at the wind once I've designed my form and make sure it's not making any negative effects for my surrounding buildings. I can look into daylighting analysis and, as I just mentioned, full building analysis. And, you know, revisiting these throughout the process. You know, it's not linear. I can you know, after I do this daylighting analysis, I might want to check back in with solar to understand, okay, well, if I change these shading devices for my daylighting design, how does that affect my solar design? And at the end of the day, you know, our, our goal is to get a high-performing building. Um, you know, checking in on this dial each and every now and then, this dial sits in a lot of our tools to help you check in throughout the design process. And we want to get to green because when we're at green, it means we're close to the 2030 goal. So I'll pause again for any questions that we have on the line. We had some coming in while you were um, speaking. Um, so I'm going to get right into them, Stephanie. Uh, great, folks, great. if you have questions, uh, you can add them to the list um, by putting them in the chat box. Or Hastings, if you have questions um, after um, we get these read, then you definitely can unmute yourself and um, speak up um, through your microphone. Okay, so one of them that came in is what should those dials
of numbers B um, or threshold numbers B, and which what um, are they always set to the 2030 challenge? Right. So I'm going to scroll back up to that so I have a visual to help explain. So this dial here, um, energy cost means it represents one number, kind of one number based on the selection views made here, but it also represents a range. Um, so something you know that we find valuable in the very early design stages, you probably don't know exactly what wall construction you're using, and that's okay. So you can set, you know, you can select the multiple ones, you know, consider X, Y, and Z, and that's what produces the range because we're allowing you to consider more than one option. Um, so this is color. The color is coded to the um, architecture 2030. So essentially, we want to enable people to design the most efficient building. So the dial will really turn green um, once you've hit that architecture 2030 goal. It'll turn orange when you're close, um, but it won't turn green until you hit it. Um, you can also set your own performance goal. So for example, um, if you're if you're you're not committed to the architecture 2030 goal, but maybe you want to set it a little bit above um, to some other standard or something, you can set that own goal. So right now, um, there's architecture 2030 is the one that the color coding is based off of, um, but you can also set your own goal and use your own performance. Unfortunately, it just won't turn green if you hit your own goal. Thanks, Stephanie. Okay, the, another question we received is, in regards to the dashboard you, uh, dashboard you uh, showed in the video, is the software all one software or many softwares? So that's a really good question. And so what I showed you just now was a web browser. Um, that video was a web browser. Again, just something like Forma that I showed where I can just kind of log in um, and check on this. But this interface, this dial is also embedded um, in Revit, which is our BIM tool. Our BIM, it lets you do really detailed building analysis. Um, and so that's embedded in there, and that dial there is actually based on the Revit model you are building. Okay, related to that, um, someone asked, uh, what is the name of the dashboard and how do we get access to what you're um, showing, or are you going to show us that? Yep, I'll definitely, I can definitely dive into that. This is called um, the energy cost range. Um, our, it's accessible through our analysis engine called Green Building Studio. And it's, yep, I can definitely follow up with the link, um, and you'll just have to use a specific login, and then you can start to access this and play around with it. Okay, we have a large list, so hang in there, Stephanie. Um, no how do you how do you make sure that you are complying with the building design codes and regulations when uh, we are designing the buildings on these softwares? Right. So that's a really great question. So right now, there's not specific codes built in. And the reason that exists is because if we have an international group of users and there's so many different um, building codes per location, that would be an infinite list. Um, and it would be a lot of work to keep it updated and to keep everything going. So if you're, specific, if you're looking for specifics to your um, district or city or state's um, building performance codes, that's something that you're going to want to check in on. Um, and there's a lot of additional tools that kind of plug into this main workflow that allow you to check in on that. But this main workflow itself, um, it doesn't provide that um, just given because we have so many international users. Um, it would be really hard to pick which ones are going to be the most ones, important ones to feature right now. However, the results um, that you get out of these tools, um, for example, you know, um, there might be specific requirements about loads in your area. And you can use this information to say, yes, I'm meeting those requirements, or no, I'm not. OK, thanks, Stephanie. We have um, three more, and then I'll unmute um, Hastings if they have anything. Um, what is net zero, and are people making net zero goals? Great. That's a really great question. So apologize for not introducing that earlier. Um, so net zero is essentially a goal for a building um, where it's you know, net zero, it is not using any energy. And there's different ways to approach net zero. So for example, with Architecture 2030, I mentioned um, they want to work to include renewables. So 
some one way you can choose net achieve net zero energy for a building is by designing really great passive systems. You know, inevitably you might have to use a little bit of energy, but you can offset that by having on-site renewables. So for example, if I design a really great efficient building, it's using a little bit of energy um, because I, I tried to capitalize as best I could on my passive systems, but for example, it might just be really cold and I, you know, I need to kick in the heat in the winter time. I can use solar panels on my building to help generate on-site energy to offset that use. So net zero is really energy use equals zero. Um, and whether you achieve that just by the building's performance alone or you're using renewables to help you get there, that's the main idea. Are people designing to net zero? Yes. Is it easy? Not always. Um, but given your climate, um, given kind of what the building you're type you're trying to design for, you know, for example, a hospital, an office building, um, a school, it's going to make you use different design strategies and you're going to want to approach um, a net zero energy goal differently. Um, but that's not to say it's impossible at all. You know, there's projects, there's a lot of net zero school projects, there's a lot of net zero office projects, and these are, you know, depending on how where the building is located are maybe just using passive strategies or they're using a mix of renewables and passive strategies. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to approach net zero. Like I mentioned earlier, unfortunately there's not a manual just because it varies so differently on your climate, your location, and your building type. And so in terms of, in reference to these tools, um, these tools can help you report on your energy use. Um, one thing you might want to look at is your energy use intensity, known as your EUI, um, and that's a metric that you can report out on. And you can use that to check, okay, how far am I from net zero? Is it reasonable to offset my small energy use with renewables and to, in order to achieve net zero energy? Okay, two more and then we'll open it up for uh, the live mic. Um, what is the success rate of these models? So that's a great question. Um, I'm assuming it's going to be kind of success rate in terms of implementing and also questions around accuracy. So one of the things that we're striving for um, with these tools is to help people design more sustainable buildings. Um, there's a lot of industry standards around them. That's why I wanted to bring it up early. It's widely used in the industry and it's being adopted pretty rapidly. Um, oftentimes there's requirements um, that the designers and engineers are needing to use them in a project. So because of the adoption of them, um, the way we see it, we see an opportunity. So people are already using these models to um, visualize and communicate their design. Why not have them take it a step further and do analysis? Um, and so we're seeing a lot of uptake on the analysis side of things because they already have a model. Um, why not take it a step further and, you know, start generating daylighting analysis. Um, why not take it a step further and check in and actually use it to inform your design? In terms of accuracy, um, all of the analysis engines we use, and so here's a little bit of the back end of energy modeling and daylighting analysis, right? All of this information and all of these computations are, are, based, off of, are based off of complex algorithms um, on the back end um, of our analysis tools. Um, so, for example, if you're modeling, what you're, you're interfacing really directly with is you're saying, you know, do daylighting analysis, and you're specifying a few settings, and then you're getting your results back. What's happening on the back end is we're sending your model to an analysis engine, um, and these analysis engines have been validated um, with a lot of existing data. For example, um, for, this, for daylighting, you know, we're comparing it with actual measured um, daylighting measurements for illuminance in the building. So how does our simulation compare to the actual conditions? Um, and we're also validating it. There's uh, several other industry standard analysis engines that the Department of Energy, the U.S. Department of Energy, promote as valid engines. And we also validate our engines against that to make sure that we're giving our users quality and valid results that they can trust. Okay, we've had a couple more come in. I'm going to read one more and then open it up to Hastings, and then if they don't have any, we'll uh, take the last ones. Okay. So what reduction in, in energy do you need to meet net zero? That's a good question. So I'm going to say, again, it's based off of your location and building type. Um, so Architecture 2030, they kind of break it down. Let's go back there. 
they're breaking it down. They're essentially, you know, if we are calling, if what's this carbon neutral here, we can define that as net zero. So today, to help us kind of stay on track, they're suggesting a 70% reduction from the mean to keep us on track to essentially have all new buildings be net zero in 2030. So the reduction of energy, again, um, for example, a building in San Francisco, um, because we have a different climate than Grand Island, we're going to have a different average. We're going to have a different building average, um, building energy use average. So that's why it's a percentage. Um, it's hard to say specifically what your reduction is going to be. Um, you know, always kind of go for gold. And look, it's easy to understand. Um, what I would suggest is understand really what your mean energy use for your building type is in your location. And once you understand that, you can start to set goals. Okay, I want to be 70% better than that. You know, I want to reduce 70 by 70% than the average. I want to reduce by 80. I want to reduce by 90. You know, a full reduction of that is going to be net zero. Um, but keep in mind that you're going to, you can offset that with renewables. So I'm going to unmute Hastings. Um, they, well, I'm unmuting them on their end. They'll have to unmute themselves also on their end. Uh, the Hastings team, if you have any questions, um, feel free to speak into the mic. We'll give you just a minute here, and then I'm gonna, if not, I'll read the other uh, chat box questions. I don't know if they're having trouble with their mic or if they don't have any questions. So I'm going to ask this last one. Um, please interrupt, Hastings. You are un unmuted on my end, but you'll have to unmute yourself uh, to speak. Just interrupt if you have anything. So the last question that came in, Stephanie, was how do we get a hold of energy use intensities or energy use averages for our region? Great. Um, so resources like Architecture 2030, um, Architecture 2030 also put together a project called the 2030 Palette, which I'll um, introduce again towards the end. Um, these are great resources. Um, also, um, if you kind of, there's what we call a CBEX, C-B-E-C-S, um, it's a really large database um, that categorizes building location and building type and energy uses, usage. Um, so again, a CBE at CBEX, um, and that's a good, that would be a great resource to understand um, what, the, and it's essentially kind of a census for buildings. Um, it's, it's kind of it's a poll of, um, for, uh, for U.S. building data. Okay, we have a comment that I'm going to read, and you can verify if it's true, and then from there you can move forward. Um, I re just recently saw that Autodesk is in partnership with Brad Pitt's Make It Right Foundation. I guess if you want to comment on that, you're welcome to. And if not, we don't have any other um, questions, Stephanie. Right. So that's um, relevant because I used to, that's part, yeah, Autodesk has a foundation, um, the Autodesk Foundation. And I used to work previously really closely with the Autodesk Foundation before I became a technical evangelist for the team I'm on now. And yes, that is very true. Um, I actually had the great opportunity of being able to tour one of the Make It Right houses in the lower, in the ninth ward in New Orleans. Um, and really, you know, um, they are trying to achieve kind of what we're talking about, right, and really focusing on the building occupant. We're trying to build homes and buildings for communities and families that A, they're comfortable in, that are using less energy, that's costing them less money. Um, so yes, it's a really great organization. Um, Autodesk is, the Autodesk Foundation is partnered with them. Um, and you know, we are always looking for opportunities to help um, groups, architecture groups, design firms, engineering firms who are trying to make an impact um, in their community and, and through their buildings on how we can help them. Okay, we haven't received anything else, so please move forward. All right. I'm just going to hop back to where we were. All right, and so this last piece, which I think will probably be um, really relevant, I think hopefully a lot of you will, will kind of take this as, you know, your, jump, your jumping off point was resources for learning more. So um, 
Scott mentioned in the introduction that um, I previously worked on authoring these building performance analysis courses, and that's what I'm going to cover right now. Because again, as I mentioned, unfortunately, um, I can't cover everything about building performance analysis. I just wanted to give you all a taste um, and give you the tools to go forward. As I mentioned, you know, all these tools that I'm talking about are freely available um, to educators and students. Um, we have free training courses that kind of teach you exactly how to use the software to do these different types of analyses that I talked about. So I want to make sure that you're enabled to go forward and do that. And the rationale behind this project and this program is to make it accessible to learn the skills required to learn industry-wide transition to performance-based design. As I mentioned earlier, um, there is this critical need in industry for people to be able, and designers, and engineers, and construction managers to be able to predict a building's performance, but the firms have this hole. They don't have, they can't find the staff, they can't find the resources. Um, so if you take away anything from this presentation, I hope it's that um, you can fill this void. Um, you know, you can learn these skills and you can become extremely valuable and, and fill this void and help design better buildings and help change the state of, of the industry right now. So um, after a bunch of research, um, we found a lot of kind of holes that helped us develop this curriculum. And one of them was that architecture students weren't learning enough about building the science and analysis around the, the building physics of things, around how um, you know, our environment is interacting with our um, buildings in terms of analytics. We also found that a lot of engineering students didn't learn specifically around buildings. And I come right from this camp. Um, I was studying civil engineering um, and doing a lot of physics um, and a lot of math classes, but I, didn't, I couldn't really directly apply it to actual buildings. Um, and so there's, there's that kind of void as well. Um, and additionally, you know, when we talk about education, we want, we're, you know, it's easy to talk about academia, but we also have to remember that professionals are being asked to use new tools and processes and adapt to these new codes. They need to adapt to Architecture 2030. They need to adapt to net zero energy requests by building owners. And they need to know how to do um, building performance analysis as well. And so what was created was the Building Performance Analysis Certificate. And what it is is it's a free online educational program that teaches the fundamentals of building performance analysis as well as tying it to actual tool usage. So it's more than just click this button to get your results. It talks about what your results mean, how you can start to interpret them, and how you can use them to move forward with design decisions. And here's just an outline of what the course looks like. Um, you know, it kind of covers a lot of different things. And so it's a longer course. Um, it takes about, you know, I would say 30 to 50 hours to complete, depending upon your experience. But each of these sections also stands alone. So, for example, if you're only interested in daylighting, you can just focus on the daylighting portion. Um, so there's talking about, we're talking about energy literacy and building loads, um, climate and weather analysis. I just gave you one slide on that, right, talking about temperature and, and wind roses. Um, we've developed a whole course on that because it's so important into understanding your building's performance. Um, solar studies, wind and airflow studies, daylighting, as well as whole building energy analysis. So it's this curriculum that kind of really, you know, exactly what I just showed you starts to cover that and dive deep into it. So software, I mentioned this is all freely available to students and educators, and there was a question earlier around, is this one tool, is this multiple tools, what is it? Um, so most of the work is done in Revit, which is you know, it's just Autodesk's response to BIM. Revit lets you build these very detailed 3D models that can be used by architects, engineers, construction managers. Green Building Studio is our analysis engine. Um, so when we do energy analysis, um, Revit is communicating with Green Building Studio. You're not having to do any extra work, um, just it's so you know that Green Building Studio is, is where we're doing the energy analysis. Um, flow design is something that plugs, so Green Building Studio plugs into Revit, flow design plugs into Revit. Flow design is the airflow, that wind tunnel simulation that I showed you. And then also there's this lighting analysis piece, this daylighting piece, and this plugs into Revit. Um, so really, you're only working in Revit, uh, and you have these different analysis engines that are plugging in. And I just laid that out just kind of for clarity, so you were aware, if you hear these other names, how they're relating to it. 
The way the certificate works um, is it uses case studies. So we're talking about building examples. One of the best ways to learn about this, remember, is we kind of mentioned experience. And so by learning through application and using case studies, we're trying to um, expose the people who are taking the certificate course to different design scenarios. And so they can start to build on that experience in different case studies. Um, there's fundamental articles, um, and these are software agnostic. So, for example, if you want to learn um, about different temperature um, and how different passive design strategies can map to different temperatures or different climate conditions, these fundamental articles cover that. Um, there's also software playlists. Now, here's where we're kind of diving into the actual software use. So we're giving you instruction and some videos, um, some playlists on how you can go about um, using these tools for building information. And what we're doing is we're not requiring you to model the buildings yourself. We're giving you a building model, and we're giving you instruction on to how you can look through things. So there's no modeling requirements for this course. Um, and finally, there's, there's quizzes and software exercises, right? If we're going to give you a certificate, we need to know that you did your homework and that you know the material. So there's quizzes that are based on the fundamental materials. Um, and there's also quizzes that are based off of the software. So again, we'll give you a building model, we'll ask you to do some analysis, and we'll ask you to interpret the results you get. Um, there's a syllabus for each course that kind of breaks down and gives you kind of a visual overlay of what the course looks like. This is an example for the daylighting course. Um, there's an introduction, we're gonna, then we're going to cover the fundamentals of light. Um, you know, how, does, how much light is required for specific tasks, what's glare, what causes it, how can we avoid it. Um, there's also, so now we have strategies for daylighting section. So this would be, you know, how do we size our shades, how do we size our light shelves, um, what do light shelves do even, um, and how we can use, we can capitalize on daylighting. And then there's a daylighting analysis section, and this section is going to be where we're using the software. This is where we're going to be in Revit, we're going to be playing around with the model, and we're going to be creating some of those visual results I showed you earlier. And finally, there's usually a synthesis and a wrap-up section to just essentially summarize um, you know, your top three or four points that you should remember uh, going forward about daylighting. So as I mentioned, it's, it's free, it's online, it's self-paced. This is a screen grab of, of what one of the courses looks like. I kind of have everything laid out over here. Um, these blue books are some articles that I'll be reading. These little notepad ones are, are quizzes that I'll be taking. Um, there's usually a little header right here to kind of give you some guidance as to what you'll be covering. And in this example, we're, you're going to be watching a video um, on how to do some energy analysis, some early stage energy analysis. And this is pretty typical for all of the sections. And again, it's web-based and it's self-paced. Um, but also, we've enabled it so that it can tie to a class. So a student or an educator can do it on their own if they want to do a little bit of self-study. Um, but it also can tie to a class. We've seen it tied to design studios or environmental systems courses. Essentially, the instructor will assign different sections as they're covering that material in their class. So this program was launched um, in August of 2013. However, there was two years of piloting prior to that. Um, so it's, it, we've been doing a lot of research and a lot of work to make this really serve the community as best as we can. Um, again, working with mostly students and educators, we also have a fair amount of professionals who are taking the course um, to help keep them up to date on the latest software tools. Um, and so for a student perspective, which we were really excited about is, remember I mentioned that, that there's that gap in the industry, that there's not enough people who have these skills. Um, after going through this course, a student um, was able to land an internship at a firm they were really happy to be about, be at because of this certificate, because this certificate proved that they had the know-how for green building design. Um, an educator perspective on that is, you know, this allowed them to restructure their course, and as a result, they were starting to get higher course evaluation marks, which really helped enable them as well. Um, you know, again, one of the purposes of this presentation, things are changing every day. There's new practices. There's always new software tools. We can't expect educators to always be up to date on every single thing. So by creating this course, um, we're hopefully giving them kind of an off-the-shelf tool they can use in their classrooms to help um, get their students onboarding with what the industry needs. 
So as I mentioned, you know, it can range depending upon your experience. If you've never used Revit before, it'll probably take you 30 hours plus a little bit more, maybe 30 to 40 hours. If you're familiar with Revit, you might be able to do it a little bit faster just because you're more, um, you're quick to navigate. But as I mentioned, no, no modeling experience is required. We're just requiring you to download Revit, open some models we're giving you, and then you're going to kind of go through a series of steps and instructions to check in on that model. Registration is open. You can register at any time of year. It's always open. As I mentioned, you know, as an educator, if you're interested in using this in your class, um, all you have to do is email um, BPAC, the Building Performance Analysis Certificate. We affectionately refer to it as BPAC internally. Um, you just have to email BPAC at autodesk.com, and we'll set you up with kind of a virtual classroom where you can track the progress of your students, and you can make sure that they're doing what you've assigned to them. And this is an image of the certificate that you'll get at the end, and it'll have your name and the date you complete it. Um, and Carl Bass, our, our CEO, it'll have his signature on it. And so as I mentioned, you know, we did over two years of piloting, and we're still collecting a ton of feedback on this. Um, we have over, I would say, I think 13,000 people internationally um, in this course right now. And um, previously when I was working on this, you know, I can confirm we read every bit of feedback. We want to make sure this is useful. If something's not working, we need to know. Um, if something doesn't make sense, we can help clarify it. Um, we're really committed to, you know, enabling this industry transition through education. And, you know, I really believe students and educators are the place to start as the next generation entering the building design industry. Um, and so you can access this at autodesk.com slash BPAC. You can find a landing page. There will be some videos about it. Um, you know, and again, any questions ever, I'm going to include my contact information at the end. So always feel free to reach out. So here's a quick rundown of resources available to you. Um, and I can send this out to the team who can circulate this broader if that's helpful. I mentioned the 2030 palette. This is an initiative by Architecture 2030 and, and the makers of the 2030 challenge um, that really detailed out. It's a great resource for a ton of case studies um, and examples of really great passive and sustainable design. Definitely check it out. Um, it's really great. And we've also started to integrate that into some of the courses that I've just mentioned. The Autodesk Education Community is where you can download all that software for free. Um, a lot, all the software I showed you today and all those screenshots from within the tools is, is freely available to you. Um, you'll just have to create an account, um, and then you can download a, the student licensing. The Sustainability Workshop, that first video, that Yes, the first video I showed you um, that talked about the passive design strategies. Um, and that and a lot more information you can find on the sustainability workshop. There's a mix of software. There's a mix of fundamental material. There's a lot more videos. Um, it's a great resource to kind of thumb through. And finally, sustainability solutions. You know, I'm not on the only sustainability-focused team here at Autodesk. My team is really focused on these analysis tools. Um, but there's several other teams within Autodesk, and one of them is the Sustainability Solutions team. Um, you can find them at sustainability.autodesk.com and see what they're up to. Um, they look, um, my team is really focused on kind of the analysis for one building, um, but, you know, they do a lot of uh, stormwater management analysis tools, a lot of infrastructure-based tools, so they're also a really great resource if you're interested in sustainability beyond the building design. So with that, I'll pause again um, and do any questions before I kind of do a quick wrap up. So folks, this is your last chance to get questions to Stephanie. You can enter them in the chat box or if you're on the Hastings campus. I have unmuted you, so you may um, unmute yourself as well and then speak directly to Stephanie to ask the questions. We're just going to give everyone a few um, a minute, just a minute or two here, and then we will move forward. So please get them in quickly if you have any. Okay, so we've got one that just came in, Stephanie. Uh, what computer specs do you need to run this software? Good question. Um, so some of the, the one tool I showed earlier, the form is a web-based one, and the energy cost range where you can access that from the web, since those are web-based, you just need a, a good internet connection. You can run them on a Mac or a PC. 
Um, as we talk about, you know, Revit, I mentioned Revit and all of its friends here. Revit's going to run on a PC. Um, there's specific requirements um, surrounding that. If you guys think just Google Revit system requirements, you'll get those details. Um, it is, you know, it is a pretty big modeling piece of software. Um, it lets you do a lot, so you are going to want to make sure um, that, you know, it's up to date. However, you know, if you kind of, I've had, I've had computers that are five years old that run Revit great, and that's just because I kind of keep them cleaned up and I don't bog them down with a lot of other software. Okay, I'm well, um, giving people one more moment. The Hastings mic, I, it's hard for them, I'm sure, to interrupt. So you can type it in in Hastings, or you can uh, speak by unmuting yourself. If you don't have any questions, that's okay. We have uh, several online viewers. We have another one coming in. Does this certificate give you the skill set to get other certifications like LEED AP or CEM? That's a great question, and we get it a lot. So um, this certification, I think, will give you a lot of background and a lot of ground to stand on um, for LEED. So for example, if you're pursuing your LEED GA or your LEED AP, um, those certifications are really going to focus on um, the lead specifics, so understanding credits, um, understanding kind of the vocabulary in the credits, and, and how you might implement them. We don't cover specific lead credits in this course, and again, that reasoning um, is because, remember, we have a ton of international users, and lead isn't used everywhere. So if we made a lead-focused course, um, it might not be applicable to everyone. However, I mean, what this is really going to do is it's going to teach you the strategies and the analysis you can use to um, achieve a lead certified building. So it'll be a good background. I think if you're pursuing lead certification for yourself, you know, your lead AP or your lead GA, um, but it'll be, be really good grounding, but it won't specifically, it's not a direct precursor in that it won't cover the specific lead credits you'll probably need to know for those exams. We have a viewer asking if any of your software covers water use and conservation modeling? Mm, that's a great question. So I would definitely check out sustainability.autodesk.com. Um, we have some, they have some stormwater tools um, that might, that sound like they might be interesting. And also, um, there's a piece of software called InfraWorks, um, which, let, which lets you kind of look at city scale um, and how we can, and ideas of how to start kind of implementing water use there would be really interesting to hear about. In response to your lead comments, uh, does your software help with uh, meeting uh, living building challenge targets? Right. So again, um, it's not specifically, there's not a box that says, check, you met living building challenges. Um, but again, by under, by use, by checking in on the results you're getting, um, you know, if living building challenge or any really other kind of lead, any other certification, you're looking for your building performance metrics. You know, if they have those, usually, you know, you need to achieve X percentage or X around. Those are results that our software are giving you can help you understand those. And that's also, you know, um, a lot of our software, we allow other people to develop their own plugins for it. Um, so that's not to say that, you know, it's not innately in our software is what I'm saying. It's, Someone may have developed a plugin and made it available to kind of pull all results and parse them to whatever um, building code or building challenge you're trying to meet. That was the last one that um, I've received, so I'm going to let you move forward and okay. um, got to okay. ask you to get ready and you can close out after she is finished. All right, Go great. Ahead. Thank you. So in summary, um, I know it was a long two hours and it's a Friday, um, so I just want to make sure that we kind of remember. So first is, you know, there's a call to action to design buildings that are more energy efficient and consume less resources. Um, you know, that's why I'm doing what I do. You know, I'm really passionate about sustainable building design. I really love building performance analysis. I love data. I love diving deep and seeing how things work, and I love asking questions. 
And so building performance analysis can lead to more informed design decisions, better design decisions through iterative testing and analysis. You know, building performance analysis really lets you kind of test your hypothesis about how a building might perform. Well, if I put shades on, so how does that affect my solar heat gain, for example, if you test those types of questions? And building performance analysis should be considered early and throughout the design process to encourage sustainable design decisions. So a really strong example I hear all the time, um, a lot of people, you know, there's, I work with a lot of energy analysts, and their job is to work with architects, engineers, um, to make sure that the building is hitting any energy targets, any codes or regulations. Um, and a lot of times, you know, they're being asked to help the building achieve net zero energy. Um, and oftentimes the case is they come to us and say, wow, I really wish I had seen this building six months ago. Um, I had seen this building information model six months ago because so many design decisions were made without checking in on energy use or without checking in on daylighting that now the whole building's designed and they're asking me to try and get net zero and I can't do it because too many of the design decisions have been made. Um, so again, if we think about it early, we're going to design a better building. And finally, there's a lot of free resources out there to help students, educators, professionals, anyone get up to date, integrate building performance analysis into your studies, bring it into your classroom. And again, you know, even if it's just self-study, if it's something you're interested in, I think it's, it's really great. It's a really exciting time. You know, technology is changing every day. We're putting sensors in buildings and we're doing all this analysis. So it's a really great time for building a performance analysis, and I think there's a lot of exciting things to come up through the year. So I really encourage you, if it sounds interesting, to, to pursue it. And because the industry needs you, um, the industry needs you to help change things. So that's it. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for your time. Um, my contact information is down here at the bottom. Um, and the last link is a blog um, for the Autodesk Building Performance Analysis blog, where you can always kind of get our latest. So, Feel free to reach out if you have any, ever have any questions and check out the blog if you want to know more about um, our analysis tools and what we're doing. And hopefully um, we have a new generation of building performance analysts um, on the line who are going to move forward and start changing things. Thank you, Stephanie. I'm going to hand it over to Batch to close out the presentation for us. Thank you very much, Stephanie, for that wonderful presentation and really enjoyed all the, the information that you provided for us today. And we are grateful for everyone who attended the presentation and to all the presenters of um, this uh, SLW um, series, building series, uh, as this is the last of uh, presentation for the spring semester. Um, so with that being said, you can go and visit the Sustainability Leadership Workshops page at www.cccneb.edu backslash SLW for past presentations and updates on future presentations. And also, we have a Sustainability Leadership Presentation Series that is directly related to the workshops um, on Thursday, May 7th at 3.30 p.m. If you'd like more information on that, go ahead and visit uh, www.cccneb.edu backslash SLPS. And to everyone, have a fantastic Friday.